Oh, okay, yes, you me, it was me. Uh, I'm uh, Yuri Demchenko, University of Amsterdam. I'm actually an infrastructure researcher, cloud big data. I'm interested in the, a, any implementations of the virtual environment, what can be provisioned on demand for research purposes. Yes. And so now the person I haven't called yet because I don't see a name here. But I see a picture. Okay. I think we missed Freddie, didn't we? Yes, so I, I, on my screen, there's no name on, on the picture. So, Freddie? <laughs> okay. Uh, hello, I am, my name is Freddie. I am from Ecuador. I am responsible for maintaining um, uh, administrate repositories in Ecuador. We we are the consortium for development of our research in academia in Ecuador, and uh, we improve the the repositories, uh, management of data, uh, collaborate of repositories, and we we are more interested interesting in the new topics that. Uh, we review in this in this event. Okay, great. So yeah, yesterday was already above where we started. So that was organized by Andrew, um, who organized Andrew, and um, we talked of visions um, for the next ten to twenty years. What would be interesting um, in the world of virtual research environment? That this is an interest group, and I will give a short introduction. So I heard that. Some people would like to know what is a virtual research environment. So let me start with my presentation and a nice reminder. In the chat room, you see the URL to the collaborative notes and we'll put it there. And it would be nice if you sign up with your name and contact details. So if we look at the state of the art and research, so we have really this complex infrastructures and complex research questions so we can answer nowadays research questions you couldn't even ask 10, 15 years ago and there's more and more complex hardware, lab instruments, so data volume is really increasing and also the variety of data formats. So there's really this need for end-to-end -end solution for the researchers where they can access all the data and the software and computing services, equipment, and really can, can work it in, in a way that it fits to their research workflow. And to make out of this little sad looking researcher, a happy researcher, that is the goal of the virtual research environments, science gateways and virtual labs. And we are using these terms really um, as synonyms for, for each other. And um, so if, if you look at this picture, so you can look at, at the aspects of virtual research environments and science gateways from different perspectives. And so you might have heard already, maybe the yeah, science gateways, a lot of you heard virtual research environments or virtual labs, or maybe a research portal, or that it is a collaboratory or cyber infrastructure. Cyber infrastructure is often used in, in the US and by NSF also. So if you look at the timeline, all this uh, interest group developed in the last couple of years. So we had above at the seventh plenary, like now four and a half years ago. And it was really a kickoff meeting to establish this interest group and the discussions what, what we could do, it, especially related to data. And so there was the idea in the eighth plenary to discuss, so to look at the support of interoperability across the different systems, national, international platforms, and that there could be a coordinated approach. And in this session, there were really also good uh, discussions about, do we talk about the same things? What is the use of terms? So we have discussed a lot. Can we use virtual research environment, virtual labs, and science gate, the terms as yeah, as synonyms for each other. 
because it's always important also to have a verbiage that everyone understands the same things under it. Um, and in the next plenary, we discussed, yeah, how do we do sustainable online research environments with all these multiple infrastructures? So often, especially the computing data infrastructures are um, national. So how, how can we collaborate on a level that it's international? And then we went to collaborative development of sustainable uh, research infrastructures. And the next plenary was about for users and for developers. So how, how do I find all the different solutions which are already out there? There are really a lot of material solutions and what skills do I need to build and use them? So really from the user side, what is specific skills do I need? And um, so we went to catalogs, for example, the Science Gateways Community Institute has a catalog. We discussed yesterday that there are several resources, for example, in Australia, about all the virtual labs. Then the next thing was, so we want to transfer in the 12th plenary, we want to transform data into information and knowledge. So how can virtual research environments support that? And from, from this topic, because often we try to, you know, get new topics for the next plenary in the current plenary, we, we do these sessions. So we went to new concept and technologies like cloud and um, containerizations. And how do they help to improve sustainability and reproducibility of VIEs? So that was a discussion in the 13th plenary. And then we looked at a common reference model and a catalog of design patterns on the 14th. And the 15th plenary was about really looking into towards a common reference architecture. And what's, um, what are the efforts in the different continents and how could we work together and collaborate. And we had at the beginning of this year already also community calls. And we planned, um, so how, how to have a working group for a common reference architecture. And we had two calls for different time zones. And then we got a little bit off timeline to build a working group because of COVID, which is not so surprising. I guess a couple of you made the same experience that some things went a little bit slower than planned. So if you look at the virtual research environment interest group, we plan this as an ongoing community effort and open-ended. So that is the structure RDA allows with the interest group as long as there's active interest and really um, a community behind that it's interested. And so for example, the BOF, Yesterday was about the visions for future research environments. And um, in the VIE IG, we already planned for a working group toward a common reference architecture. What would be the next step? What a working group, RDA defines working groups with really um, yeah, defined outcomes, outputs for, for a certain amount of time. So it's, the interest group, as you have seen, goes on almost five years now while we, the working groups are, are shorter, which makes sense to have really this, um, let's say, energy and, and not spreading it over a couple of years, but to have something between the plenaries to work on and have um, a community coming together besides the plenaries. So and the idea for us is that we want to build in the next years more and more working groups on, on specific topics to, to create output and bring the larger area in a better condition. And some topics might come back, um, have done a different aspect a year or two years later again and come up again. So if we look at our topic for, for this session, the virtual research environment with collaboration tools, what are we looking at? So in this little pyramid, um, so I thought about, often we think collaboration tools is something like chats are working in groups where, where you can 
really exchange information and knowledge and data, or you have workspaces you can share. So and sharing is really the key in collaboration tools. So the typical, let's say, um, content of virtual research environments, for example, could be standards or information about theory, or you share methods, workflows, data, metadata, or maybe tools, videos. So this really leads to research results and maybe also teaching content, dependent on what your uh, virtual research environment is about. And out of that, you really create knowledge and information which hopefully results in a scientific publication or publication in general. And with all this knowledge and the possibilities, you can also move on to the next vision and have maybe novel research ideas. So that would be my little pyramid with collaboration tools. And I would now end this here and stop sharing. And give Mike Sentner the stage, and you can share your screen, Mike. Yes, I can. <clears throat> All right. We sing. Go ahead. And I wanted to say, so people can also ask directly after each talk questions, if you have questions, sorry, I didn't, <laughs> didn't say that at the beginning. So you structured it a little bit that it looks like there's only after all the talks uh, a possibility for asking questions. No, please ask also in between questions if you have questions. Sorry, Mike. I think it's probably a good time to pause uh, Sandra and, and ask for some questions because a number of people were wanting to find out about what VLs were, uh, what VREs were. Yeah. So yeah, the description I gave at, some, at the beginning was the definition of virtual research environment. It's tailored to a community needs. It's an infrastructure and a, as I, yeah, had the elephant picture. <laughs> you might have heard about portals, or nowadays sometimes it's more called dashboards. Uh, but it's really it's tailored to a user community for the research to access or hide uh, as far as desirable um, underlying complex infrastructure. So that would be the definition for science gateway virtual research environments I would use. Yeah, no, I was just asking if anybody had any questions in regards to what you said, that's all. Oh, okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions at this point for, for Sandra? All right, we might move on to Michael and then uh, we can come back to some Q&A questions later on. Michael, stage is yours. Okay, <clears throat> can you see my slide and am I sounding okay? Yes. Both are good. Okay. So um, Sandra asked that I talk about the US perspective on this and I <clears throat> have a question mark about that that maybe will make sense as we get into it. But for me, science gateways are all about connections. <clears throat> and when these things first got started, that was about connections between scientific software and supercomputers and that was pretty much it. But as time has gone on, uh, these things have connected to massive audiences of researchers and students who use these codes, even though they didn't write them. It has gone on to connect to expensive instruments that generate tons of data that get consumed by all of the other entities on this on this chart. And today it's expanded to um, to be a, a place where massive data repositories exist and uh, share data. And what we're really talking about today, I think, is the added dimension on top of that, where it's also a means of connecting to each other in a meaningful way around all of these other resources that are hosted on these gateways. Some examples of this that we have in the US um, <clears throat> are a gateway that connects researchers with emergency responders who are dealing with hurricanes uh, and the storm surge that they generate. Uh, so we're bringing modelers and practitioners together. 
Uh, we have another gateway called Planting Science that links thousands of high school students with thousands of professional mentors studying plant science, plant biology projects every year. Uh, another gateway called NanoHub establishes a very large collaboration network, as you can see by this citation network of people uh, who are co-publishing about the phenomena they study on NanoHub. The National Cancer Institute in the US uh, has a hub that uh, supports a, over 130 collaborating groups right now. And they're not doing much about computation, but they're doing a lot in terms of sharing ideas and information. Um, another example is the Intercultural Learning Hub. And this is serving a community of 1400 members who are professional intercultural learning specialists. And they use this for the professional development in their community. Um, we even have, uh, everybody needs to have a COVID slide these days, and we even have a case where uh, a gateway is bringing together science with policymakers. Believe it or not, we are doing that here in the U.S., um, and uh, this is done at the UT Austin. So gateways are being used in this fashion, and I think the question <clears throat> or the request implied that there was some difference between uh, virtual research environments, which is typically the nomenclature in Europe, virtual labs, which I think we associate mostly with Australia, and science gateways mostly with the US. And at first I thought, no, there, there really shouldn't be a difference in terms of collaboration. But um, <clears throat> so I went to, to Google Scholar and did some searching. And as we look at um, References available from 1990 up to uh, today, 1990 being about when the WWW was invented. Uh, we see virtual labs, virtual research environments, and science gateway climbing in references, and virtual labs seem to be leveling off while the other two continue to be growing. But that doesn't really tell the whole story. If we split each one of these slices into two pieces, <coughs> one where uh, the variants of the three terms you see at the bottom are used in solid color, and the other where those variants are combined with the word collaboration, we see a different picture. Virtual labs becoming largely emphasized on collaboration, whereas they weren't at the start, and science gateways very little on collaboration. If we actually look at this as a plot of percentage, we see nearly 100% <clears throat> of virtual lab publications these days are talking about collaboration pretty steady on VREs and science gateways actually declining over the past 10 years in terms of the use of collaboration. So there are some differences, right? And, and I don't know exactly what those are. I didn't read all of these uh, papers, but definitely there are differences. And I'll, I'll talk about why I think that is in some cases. So the tools for collaboration, Sandra already went through much of this. There are some very obvious tools like those you see here. There's probably a second round of, of tools that you see here. And if we really thought about it, this list of tools could go on and on and on. <clears throat> and the question is, what is the role of a VRE or a science gateway with respect to these collaboration tools? Every time we see a collaboration tool, do we assimilate that into a gateway, for example? And does that process just continue sort of until we've hit across every sort of mode of collaboration and brought it into a gateway? Well, that's one way to think about it, but I, I think, and I'll, I'll show you why over the next few slides, I think that's the wrong way to think about collaboration and science gateways. In the US, I'm going to pick <clears throat> a subset of what are gateway platforms. Um, that people use to build gateways or gateway-like things. And so if you don't see one on here that you think should be on here, it's not meant to be a comprehensive list. It wouldn't even fit on the screen if it was. Uh, but there's a bunch here arranged in no particular way. Now, if I add an axis to that, <clears throat> which is basically the amount of collaboration features included in these frameworks out of the box, then I can start to see some differentiation. For example, some of these things were never actually intended to be collaboration frameworks. They were more about that connecting to data and connecting to compute and not so much about collaboration. Others, uh, a little bit more emphasized on collaboration, yet others uh, somewhat more emphasized on very specific areas in collaboration. 
and even others very heavily emphasized on collaboration. Uh, for example, I am the Hub Zero director as well, but I think out of the box, we probably have the most collaboration features out of any of these. And before you say, well, the plot's rigged because he's uh, he's got it set up for his own software, it's actually a bad thing that we're up there. And I'll explain why I think it's a bad thing. Um, and that can be explained by adding one more dimension to this chart. <clears throat> And that is the user's desire to use these collaboration features. And I don't mean their desire to use the gateway. That's a completely different thing. I'm just talking about the collaboration features contained within. And when we sort of put this into motion for that, what we see uh, <clears throat> roughly looks like this, at least qualitatively to me. And that is that the more features we have, the less people actually want to use them. And uh, intuitively that doesn't make sense initially, but it really does when you think about how we're splitting our effort across doing many things, maybe not as well as we could do just a few things. And it's a shame that we have to learn this lesson over and over again. Uh, this lesson was learned in the 1980s by a framework called Framework. Um, made by the company you see here. It was an all-in-one framework where you could do anything, except nobody liked the tools that it contained because none of them were the best of breed for those tools. And that went away. And then a decade or a decade and a half later, the same lesson got learned all over again by another thing called GeoWorks. Again, really cool, but none of the tools contained within it were best of breed. And it fell out of favor for things like uh, Microsoft Windows, which was more open and you could add different applications to it. So, you know, why do we keep thinking about this? We, we can't possibly um, provide best in class user experience and all of these uh, elements of collaboration in one inclusive environment. Even the best in the world can't do this. And if you ask me who are the best in the world, uh, I would tell you the best in the world for all inclusive environments is Disney World, but all you have to do is spend about three days in Disney World and you realize the world is not infinite, it's very finite, uh, and you're locked within this world and none of it is as good as it is in reality, when in fact if you want to see a lot of the things you'd see in Disney in reality, you should just get on a plane and go there. And the same is no different for collaboration tools. Uh, there are a lot of really great collaboration tools <clears throat> that we all love to use on a daily basis. And we're trying sometimes in a gateway to approximate these things. And I think that's a mistake. Now, each of these tools uh, serves only one or two purposes. So they're not, uh, they're not the be all end all collaboration suite. But what that does is it bends this curve much further out and people are willing to and want to use those tools. And they would rather do that than use what's embedded in an all-in-one framework. Uh, why is that? <clears throat> People will make every effort they can to go around a hurdle, no matter how short that hurdle is, if it's learning or, or whatever it is. Now, there's one exception to that, that problem. And that is when people are being chased by regulations, they'll jump over a hurdle because they have no choice other than to do that. And so we do see in the case of regulated environments, like dealing with healthcare, for example, there's a shift in this curve in a very di different direction where people are happier to use an all-inclusive environment that they can be confident is complying with regulations, whereas many of these best of breed solutions aren't really regulatory compliant, although they're trying uh, more and more to be. So <clears throat> if you asked me, uh, this isn't a great way to rely on, on the business of serving science for non-regulated science. And what we ought to be doing instead of fighting that um, battle of providing all-in-one environments is thinking about how do the environments we provide link to the common collaborative tools that people do want to use on a daily basis and monitor the activities that go on between the gateway and those different environments rather than try to duplicate them. And this gets into that question of uh, how can gateways facilitate people linking together uh, and collaborating? Well, all of that activity that goes on between these different elements of science can actually be tracked today via APIs and other mechanisms if we're sensible in how we combine gateways or VREs with these tools. And 
um, I'll get to why that's important in a minute now, but I want to start by taking a slight digression saying I get asked a lot about <clears throat> what's the role of science gateways with AI and machine learning. And the easy answer is, well, uh, they connect to the right kind of HPC resources and data sources that make AI training models fast and, and all that. But what I'd really like to say is that we shouldn't be thinking about what gateways can do for AI. We should be thinking about what AI can do for gateways. And specifically, AI can do a lot of things for gateways when we're, when we're monitoring the kinds of activities people are taking with all of those collaborative services in addition to their gateways. Some of the really big benefits that can come out of this are machine-driven science. Um, surrogate models that respond almost instantaneously so we can collaborate much faster. Provenance and reproducibility being logged and taken care of without the user ever even knowing it happens. Again, lowering that hurdle. Suggesting new collaborations we would never have discovered ourselves by, by AI methods. Basically all of your needs anticipated or many of your needs anticipated just like uh, AI today anticipates your needs to buy a plane ticket or to replenish groceries or whatever it is that you do in your daily life. Having this ubiquitous AI and machine learning along with having computing everywhere, not just on your desktop, but in virtually every device you connect to is pulling for these large benefits that are possible uh, in collaboration with science gateways. But the killer of this is non-unified privacy policies. <clears throat> Even in the United States, from state to state, we don't have the same privacy policies, much less the policies between uh, us, Canada, the European Union, Australia, and a plethora of other places. And unless we get over and get over our fear of the ultimate 100% privacy and think of a sensible solution to this, I'm afraid that a lot of these benefits that could be had from collaboration and science gateways may never be had. That to me, it's not a technical problem, it's really a policy problem. And with that, I'll, I'll close my part of the discussion. Many thanks, Mike. So um yeah for, for questions maybe raise your hand or um put hand in in the chat to so that that you can or that i can have a look who has questions and you should be able to unmute yourself no i don't see a raised hand but oh andrew um, hi, Andrew Trelore, ADC. Uh, thanks for that um, really interesting overview, Mike. Uh, you you kind of teased us by hinting about the ways in which we could tie together those disparate environments, um, the things kind of off in the bottom right segment of your graph. Um, are you talking about callback mechanisms, or have you got a, a range of other things that we should be looking at there? Well, each of these environments is providing its own API. Um, so not all of them may be as rich as others, but in the extreme, many of the things that go on between these systems can actually be monitored, monitored either for the fact that they occurred or for the content that also was passed when they occurred. Um, and so I'd say it's dependent on each, on each of the environments, um, but, how you would choose to process what you find happening in those environments and your environment uh, could be um, uh, quite interesting. So for example, even the fact that I may have sent five emails to, to three different people and interceded with uh, four different Slack interactions in and of itself tells me something about what I was doing at that point in time. And if it's combined with, I, I had just brung up the result of a computational model, you know, that gives me just a little bit more context. And all of these kinds of event streams are the things that machine learning algorithms shine at processing, the things that we don't directly understand um, ourselves, but are amenable to pattern analysis. And so I think, uh, 
over time, um, the, the kind of data that come out of these systems and can be passed into these systems is going to get richer and richer. And uh, uh, I think it's a great source of, of us in science trying to stitch all that stuff together. Whereas, um, you know, other, other domains might not care about it quite as much as we do. But certainly we have the, the possibility, if not having full reproducibility, uh, we do have the pro possibility of a lot of provenance. Um, <clears throat> I, I go back and look at something that I did three years ago. How did it? How did that come about? Um, by by tracking a lot of the actions that I take using my native tools, not using a gateway all the time. Mm. Um, I might have a chance at actually figuring that out. Whereas today, trust me, I'm hopeless <laughs> at going back three years and and seeing what I did and how it how it happened. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't see a further hand at the moment. So I would share the screen and I jump in for my colleagues from Europe. So you should see my slides. Oh, no, the Siemens and Keith slides. <laughs> they sent their greetings. They couldn't join for the session. And I give my best to present their slides. So it's about virtual research environments and research activities. And so if we look at research activities, so first of all, you yeah, you have a scientific problem, you execute it, you analyze publications, then you discover data and you have a workflow design. No, the discover data goes on to the next data management. But so, so what, what is all part of these research activities? So you need um, data management, the so data use, how to process data, you want to publish the data. And of course, it's important to have also data curation or acquisition. And between all or the underpinning infrastructure resources are there, like you want to have support for, for the technical solutions. You have monitoring. In HPC, you have scheduling or even also scheduling um, on, on a local computer. You have agreements. So it's a very complex um, yeah, infrastructure to, to address a scientific problem. It, it has a lot of technologies in there and not always the researchers themselves are, you know, the specialist in all these infrastructures or in, in data management. So it's really important for a virtual research environment to, to support that in an intuitive way. So if you, if you look at the different aspects, technical aspects, so there are the virtual research environment, science gateways, virtual labs, or problem solving environments. It's also a new upcoming or maybe not so new anymore upcoming um, term for it. And then you have these, yeah, research infrastructures. Um, you, I know that in RDA, we have used different terms also like data portals or data repositories, data infrastructure, that they have different strengths also in FOCI. So data repositories are really about having different versions and having a, um, yeah, the possibility of, of archiving, for example. Data portals might be just, for, just in Apostrophe for sharing. And if you look at the e-infrastructure, the bubble in, on, on the bottom of the slide, yeah, we have cloud, high performance computing, grid computing also still in a couple of places. So with all the different research communities, the, they want to use, yeah, the, these research infrastructures and maybe private infrastructures, maybe public clouds, maybe e-infrastructures, which are offered by EGI or by Praise or by GNT or EU that. So, and then the virtual research environments should really give access in a way to, to these different research infrastructures that, that users don't have to deal with the nitty gritty details. 
So if we come now to, to a reference architecture in that way, so what should be for collaboration or what could be this is a definition from, from the project um, VIE for EIC. And that there is, yeah, on the top is a GUI. And then you have the different aspects like, like a resource manager or user manager, query manager, um, workflow managers. Or, I mean, all these managers have, have really the, the different aspect and should be Communicate, communicating with each other and also giving the possibilities from the outside to address them like Mike talked about APIs. And all this communication goes then really to the next layer to, for example, have a data model mapper, have definition of standards like I talked at the beginning, like Google operation can also function via standards. And so, and now if you look at these building blocks, you see a lot of different aspects working together here. So for example, a metadata server, what does it mean? We have again, yeah, the graphical user interface. Then we, we have a resource manager, a data model mapper, a metadata manager. So all these different technical aspects provide one service. And the idea with these building blocks would be for collaboration that users can pick them and really look at them like, okay, maybe I don't want to work with workflows. That, that is okay. Maybe they, they just need something like a node service or application service um, and not a workflow. Maybe the next group says, oh, we really need the metadata service. We want to know it for provenance. We want to have metadata to can follow what were the, stop, the steps to achieve the research results. So the idea is here to say, we put all these technical aspects in a way together that, that it's um, yeah, pluggable and that you don't have to use everything, but you can use everything. So the idea is here that, that we really need effective user center virtual research environments and that they're open in, in a way that, that these building blocks are accessible and interoperable and following also probably fair concepts to, to work with each other and to, to have uh, really connect between different technologies. So the idea is not to define the technologies we are using in that way, but to assign building blocks in a way that, that developers and users can plug them together in a plug and play solution. So I won't add the show here. And I didn't <laughs> use the full, full 10 minutes, uh, probably Keith or Seeming would have used. So I'm happy also to answer questions as far as I can answer them for the VIE for EIC project. It, it's a European project going on for three years now, if I'm not totally wrong there. And, um, and they're looking really in this reference architecture building blocks. So, how can yeah, the re different research communities be supported with this uh, kind of open architecture? So, okay, I see questions in, in the chat. What is the point of view from using public cloud instead of premises or is, or is is there no difference? Yeah, thank you, Edgar, for, for this question. So from my point of view, there are different things. Um, one is public cloud could be interesting for researchers if they have a good offer, because it's always, of course, with cost. And I would still say nowadays, and I'm happy to be corrected there, but my experience is it's often still um, less expensive for researchers to use campus resources and not public cloud services. 
think there is some movement in, in, in the direction, but for example, I know that we got a couple of years ago um, access to Amazon cloud services for really testing it for, for a nice research project on malaria eradication and measurements for that. So Amazon was really interested in supporting this, um, but it's, we use the resources for calculations, and but as soon as it was used, for example, for us at Noel Dam, it would have been on the cost side not not interesting to use a public cloud. It would have been just more expensive than using the campus resources. So I'm not fully sure whether that is for every region and every country the same. So Andrew, Kiran, what would you say? Public cloud is it still more expensive also for you guys instead of? Add that a bit to that, Sandra. So the experience here is it depends on who you ask. Okay. Um, if from uh, from the developers who who builds these tools, uh, a lot of them tend to prefer to use uh, something like Amazon or Google. Uh, simply because of the richness of the building blocks that they have. Um, however, the cost, as you said, is certainly a, a challenge. So where it's funded out of um, research grants and so on, uh, there's a tendency to use the uh, in on-premises ones. And in, in Australia, we're lucky that we have the ARDC that funds the, the research cloud. So that's another place that a lot of those uh, get used. Uh, built on top of, um, but in in groups that that's not so much a constraint, uh, they tend to try to use the uh, um, Am mainly Amazon, uh, but also Google and the other ones uh, because of the tool set that they have in there. Andrew, you might also have comments on that. Yeah, so um, thanks, Kieran. So I guess three additional comments. Um, so one, as Kieran points out, some of the public cloud offerings have much richer service infrastructures. AWS is the best example. Uh, and we have some VRE deployments in Australia that uh, are redeployments of something that was built using AWS services. And so if you're taking something that was built using those services, say in the US, and deploying it in Australia, Look, in theory, it's possible to redeploy it on the OpenStack infrastructure that my organization runs, but it's going to take a bit of work. So one of the projects that we invested in last year is looking to do that, to take something that was designed for uh, AWS and then moving it across um, really is a kind of proof of concept. Uh, the second comment I'd make is that uh, the program that I'm responsible for and that, that Kerry administers really well is investing in a number of different VREs around the country. And part of the deal for those VREs is we say, look, we provide storage and compute infrastructure through the Nectar Research Cloud. We're also investing in your virtual research environment. You effectively get free access to that storage and compute resource uh, in order to develop your, uh, your system. Um, and then at the end of that, when your system moves into a more sustainability mode, then we'll need to have a conversation about what happens then. But at least for the, the two or three years that they're building the system, uh, they get access to storage and compute for free. And the third comment I would make is that most cl public cloud services have quite complex and sophisticated charging algorithms where you get charged for your use of compute at varying rates and at varying times and you get charged for your use of storage space and you get charged for data movement in and out of the public cloud and so you need to think quite hard about the impact of those differential charging algorithms on the cost of running your system. If you're continually moving data in and out of Amazon, the data movement charges are gonna add up quite quickly. Uh, so it's, it's by no means a, a simple, straightforward um, 
one or the other. It really depends very much on your use case, on uh, whether you're using, um, yeah, yeah, a whole range of factors. It's by no means straightforward. Great, thanks. Hey, Sandra. Yeah. I would maybe add something to that too. We did <clears throat> some pricing analysis a while ago for the gateways that we host. And for those that even did a lot of computation, but not like HPC style computation, overall it was, I'd say, more expensive to do it on AWS, but not so much more that I wouldn't consider actually doing it to avoid other hassles. But um, as Andrew pointed out, even if you're not moving a lot of data back out of Amazon, if you've got a gateway that has a lot of data and that data is not static and you're, you're changing it, you have to price in how much storage you need plus how much storage you need for backups uh, with, a, with a very robust backup plan. And that's where the, the economics just became ridiculous for us. Great. Thanks. So I don't see another hand up at the moment. So I would give it to Kira now for his talk. Thank you. All right, let's get the screen up and going. <clears throat> So I'm going to take a slightly different tact on this one. Uh, you getting my screen okay? Looks good. All right, good. So um, I'm going to give a very quick run through of what um, the landscape in Australia looks like uh, for virtual labs and, and now it's been called research platforms so we're in the process of changing names as we're moving forward and i'll explain that in a second um a disclaimer to start with uh, australia doesn't have a, a systematically documented architecture that uh, captures how the vls are built uh, and uh, what i'm going to present here is really a snapshot of um the architecture that are currently there but currently is also a bit of a misnomer here because it's a moving target uh and and while i've been got some of the diagrams in my presentation here um the thinking when some of those have evolved beyond that and and things are also in, in flux uh and, and that's because uh, we we're very lucky here to have a, a change agent called ardc australian research data commons uh, that is trying, um, is taking what was there that was built uh, a number of years ago and then trying to push it for, forwards uh, and uh, to the next evolution of things. So um, there's lots of moving parts in, in Australia at the moment on, on this front. Um, and uh, I believe at the heart of it uh, is, is Kerry. So she might jump in and say, no, Kiran, you got all those things wrong there. So uh, Kerry, feel free to do that if, if you feel the urge to do so. Um, all right, so um, what I did was I just went out there and asked the, the people in, in Australia who run the virtual labs and saying, you know, what's your architecture so can, and give, give me some of your diagrams back to me. Um, so I've got a collection here of various um, platforms that's been built uh, and, and I'll run through them really quickly. So the first one I wanted to talk about is the EcoCloud. In, in, this is a, a environment, an environment built for the environmental sciences. Uh, and in many respects, I think that's probably the most advanced thinking that we have uh, in, in Australia. Now the EcoCloud looks to bring uh, the analytic platform, the, the data, disk, data, data sources, uh, and, and also the discovery of the data. So they got uh, a, a section in there that actually essentially a Google for data uh, in there. So uh, using that platform, people can actually uh, search for data, then bring that data in, uh, analyze it uh, and store it and, and so on. 
Um, the architecture looks a little like this, and I'm not going to go into the details here, um, but um, it's it's very um, well thought through uh, and is segmented into different groups. Um, it, in a sense, it's very similar to what with Sandra presented in, uh, in, in the EOSC, uh, the, the architectures earlier. Uh, uh, it, it would fit very nicely into that model, uh, I think. Uh, the other thing that they've done is they've they started to build this and using microservices and, and technologies like uh, containers and, and so on. So uh, that's become started to become a platform that, that's been used. Um, so up here, if you can can you see my mouse as I'm moving it around or not really? Maybe I need to get the pointer going. Uh, uh, like, here we go. All right. I'm sorry, just had to get the... So out here, uh, you can see that they got uh, the Eco Cloud platform. But well, uh, in here, they've used the same platform uh, and the tool set, uh, the building block, to also create an environment that is serving the needs of the humanities. Uh, and they see that that can be replicated for other areas as well. So uh, I think that's, that's why I think that's probably one of the more advanced uh, platforms we've got here. Uh, all right, now back to the mouse, all right, uh, it, clear. This is disappearing quickly. Oh my god, there we go. Um, the other one is closely related to this is a, a platform called Coesra. Uh, this is from the eco sciences group area, and that is really a virtual desktop on the cloud. So they provide um, a virtual desktop with a whole lot of tools and access to the data, uh, which is pretty typical. Uh, of, of many of the VREs, I think. Uh, and that's their architecture, fairly simple one, uh, I think. Uh, uh, and that that's also borrowing. There's another virtual lab, which I haven't got the details, uh, called uh, CVL, uh, Characterization Virtual Lab. Uh, it's borrowing a lot of the technologies uh, and, and stacks from, from that as well. Um, another one that I think is quite mature here is Cloudstore. Now, Cloudstore is run by RNET, which is Australia's academic and research network. Uh, this is a tool that's that's platform that's evolved over many, many years. So it's taken many uh, twists and turns along the journey, but it's uh, now starting to become, again, one of the more generalized um, discipline agnostic uh, virtual environments that's coming up in Australia. So. Um, um, that's the architecture for that one. Um, it consists of, uh, it, it borrows uh, um, technologies from a, a range of places, including uh, CERN, uh, to build what is possibly very highly scalable, in, in, in my view. Um, at the other end is Stemformatics. Stemformatics is a small, it's a platform that uh, is designed to help people working on stem cells. Uh, it's been very highly regarded within the community and goes to the point that Michael was uh, highlighting uh, in there that it's one platform, limited set of features, but very carefully designed to meet the needs of one specific group of um, researchers. So that's a diagram of their architecture. It's um, fairly, I think if you're in the developer space, you'll, you'll recognize most of that uh, stack in there as a fairly common stack. It's made very lightweight, um, but they, they focus very much on getting the workflows that the researchers are looking for and, and really automating that side of it in there. Um, this is uh, the Australia, uh, uh, that, uh, this is the astronomy, uh, all Australian virtual observatory, sorry. Uh, uh, th this is for the, from the astronomy community. 
uh, to allow them to uh, look, access the data, work out where they want to look, tap into the infrastructures around the place uh, and, and do the analytics on. Again, it's the, diag the, the description of it is fairly, fairly straight, uh, simple, but there is a lot more complexity in, in there. Now this one, not so much as a, in a graphical sense because it's a lot more um, workflow driven environment. Again, they're using common stacks like Docker and, and, and so on, which uh, is getting very popular here. Third sciences, that's a description from our friend Leslie, who used to be a, a chair in here. Uh, in the earth sciences, it's very loosely coupled. Uh, there's a lot of various tools out there that, that are brought together and, and um, combined using notebooks and, and, and the data being made available. So summing or coming to looking at all of that, um, the landscape in Australia, you know, what are the observations we make? Um, it, it's very highly customized in, in here at the moment. Um, and that's both a good thing and a bad thing. In one sense, it's good because it means it, it's really serving the needs of a community. But I think uh, we are at that point where a lot of these have grown, the technologies have evolved that they don't need to be as customized um, as the explainer saw so in the uh, eco cloud and how they've gone about thinking. Uh, there's a lot of the building blocks can be built in such a way that they can be reconfigured and and and, and re you know configured to meet different needs of different groups uh, without having every piece of it uh, handcrafted from the beginning. Uh, there is a lot of variation in in the designs and and in the technology stacks that are being used here. Um, and, and we're just starting to see that emergence of that productized uh, uh, environment. And I think we'll see a lot more uh, as the, the platforms work that Kerry is leading uh, kicks into full swing and starts to uh, do their, you know, the bulk of that development happens. I think we'll start to see a lot more of that sort of uh, um, emergence of that sort of uh, technologies and that sort of designs and architectures. So if you measure this against the fairness of the virtual labs in Australia, um, findable, probably not. I think that's one of the challenge things that we're working on at the moment. Uh, uh, if you know where to look, you can find them, uh, but there is no way of automatically discovering them. Um, we don't have the technologies put in place to automatically discover it. And there's a whole conversation that goes on here uh, around you know, how much things you can do if the machine if if machine it could learn what other virtual labs are available and what they do and and so on uh, so it sort of takes the whole con conversation to a next level when that can happen accessible absolutely uh, as michael pointed out in australia these were funded and developed uh, with two purposes in mind one is to get that scientific workflow going through but also very much with a collaboration part put together. So there is accessibility for that and that collaboration is, is, was built into it from the beginning here. Uh, interoperability, mm, mostly no. Um, we, we, we haven't got them being able to talk to each other. Little bits happening here and there. Uh, so for example, Coestra talks with the eco cloud environment. So they work very closely in that. To, but Overall, not much happening there. Uh, same with reusability. There's pockets of it happening here and there, but systematically they, they're not really built with that in mind. So, um, all right. So that's the landscape in Australia. Thanks, Kira. Yes. Uh, thank you. I'm going to stop that and open up for questions, comments. So I would have directly myself a question. <laughs> um, so in Australia, I mean, this, let, let's say landscape, we see, I think also in Europe and also in the US, uh, Mike also described it, we have these different technologies. So, and I know there are some ways of, you know, you can have catalogs or, so is there already besides having a list of virtual labs, maybe another idea is how to help us, for example, finding the the virtual labs 
So I see that Carrie is <laughs> ready to answer, I think. <laughs> I'll let Kerry answer that one. <laughs> Thanks. Hang on, give me one sec. Sorry, bit of background noise here. Um, yeah, that's definitely something that we're looking at. So um, we, our virtual labs that were funded under the Nectar program from a couple of years ago, most of those are still running, um, but, we, and we have this great list of them, um, which I probably should put a link in the chat. But yeah, we don't have a searchable catalogue as such. And now um, we've run, we've just finished our second open call for new um, platforms, we're calling them. Um, and so last year's ones are starting to come online with their first, um, their first products. And so, yes, that is something that I'm working on, um, possibly doing it through Research Data Australia, which is our um, data, data and uh, services and tools catalog here in Australia. But um, yeah, hopefully also link it to some of the, uh, the other international catalogs that we um, were talking about yesterday. Yes, I, I wanted to say it, it would be great to mm. if you talk about <laughs> research environments and platforms. So I should have that now in my elephant image. I will remember yes. that yes. <laughs> to, to add yes. platforms there. Um, yeah, it would be great to have maybe really a virtual research environment with catalogs, how to find virtual research environments or platforms. Yeah. yeah. And, and also um, in terms of, Kieran gave, great, gave a great overview of um, say EcoCloud, which um, has reusable components and the platform itself is quite reusable now. Um, I would like in that catalog to have a basic overview of um, the architecture of the components so that people, if people are looking to reuse them um, and, and pull out different services. Um, for instance, some, so we haven't announced the, um, have made the final decision on the, this year's open call, but we had a lot of really interesting proposals um, with quite different architectures. Some of them are very container-based, so workflow systems that um, running on that can run on various HPCs, and it's all um, basically it's they're implementing a container catalog so that anyone can um, pick up those containers and run them. Um, others were proposing to do essentially an eco cloud redeployment. Um, with adaptations for their own specific discipline. Um, so I'd really like to see those details made really obvious so that anyone around the world can contact those projects and say, you know, yeah. we, we need, we need some, you know, um, we've got a lot of projects that are dealing with sensitive data so and, and need um, authentication and and authorization systems now, you don't need to reinvent the wheel with those. I mean, one of the ideas would be, because that is also one of the goals um, of this interest group, as I said, we want to have working groups. So maybe this could be an idea to bring the science gateways catalog from, um, yeah, SGCI, the science gateways community institute with you together and, um, and also catalogs. I know that EGI is working on something there. So maybe we, we could initiate a working group just to discuss also the concepts. Probably it's hard then to do the implementation in, in the working group. <laughs> we know the, you know, there are limits of RDA working groups, but we could have at least the exchange of ideas there and have maybe concepts and yeah, suggest that, that these different aspects are working together, the working groups behind the different catalogs that that would be great yeah i think that'd be good yeah well, well I, I think sandra if i can comment too um what would be really wonderful is if we had a, a working group focused on finding real examples of integrations that people are ready to do now right because i think in theory we all believe this is a good idea and practice Who's ready to jump on one today, right? Is it is it material science? Is it something in ecology? Um, <clears throat> what are the cases where we have gateways or research environments that have resources that would like to talk to each other that we know will never be owned under the same infrastructure? And yet there should be something that, um, some exchange between these things, whether it's multi-scale modeling or whether it's one thing feeding another. Um, 
I think generating a, a solid set of use cases that we could all um, use for reference implementations would go a long way. I might. Michael, I think you're suggesting doing the social bridges across the, the, the continents here. <laughs> it may, it may be a lofty goal. RBA. How strange is that? Great <laughs> 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 idea, Michael. <laughs> but, you know, we, we've, even in our own countries, we've been faced with this question, I'm sure, many times. And um, it, it's always, for me anyway, it's always come down to, okay, who's ready to move and put time in on it now? And then suddenly it gets a lot quieter. And it, it shouldn't, <laughs> right? So maybe I've just been unlucky and haven't found the correct uh, correct groups, but uh, it'd be nice no, but to I think a, you're, a set you're of very, challenge problems. I, I agree, Michael. I mean, that's, uh, I think, uh, Catching those low-hanging fruits are, are really, really valuable to do to get momentum on something. Um, so yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I suggest Michael keep an eye on uh, ARDC's Twitter in the next uh, next week be, as we announce our uh, 2020 projects because those new projects, as they're developing their project plans, would be the uh, ideal ideal places to start. Great. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I, I really like that. So maybe, Carrie, we, we could, uh, yeah, when I've seen it on Twitter, <laughs> we should maybe connect and we could set up with the, with Kieran and the co-chairs sure. of maybe a working group to discuss things. Yeah, that would yeah. be cool. That would be good. Uh, yeah, especially, yeah, when they all start. So they have all a starting date in, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, no, they will be announced in the next week. Um, we've got to go through contracting, which at this time of year, Australia shuts down over Christmas yeah. and <laughs> it does summer holidays. So end of January, yeah. So yeah. But, but that is, oh, that is great. <laughs> Honestly, this year doesn't have so much time anymore with supercomputing going on and yeah. Yep. You know. And then no, summer holidays in Australia, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any other any comments or questions from anybody else in the group? Edgar, you were talking about the challenges you were having uh, in your experiences with using AWS earlier on the chat. Crystal, did you want to uh, get on there and talk? Yeah, yeah, sure. This might be a bit of a tangent, sorry, but I was just, um, uh, I'm quite new to the space as well. So um, I was just wondering um, what the relationship is between the environments and the data. Um, and I understand that some gateways, you know, like STEMformatics, they're built for certain kinds of data. And then I wonder um, what the implications are for this for the kinds of data that then continue to be used in certain disciplines and whether there's sort of a, a looping happening. Um, and uh, yeah, I suppose, is, is it necessarily a foregone conclusion that these two things are inextricably linked? That's my question. So, um, sorry. Um, no, they're not. Uh, I mean, the, the idea of, of all of this is to make the the work of a, a researcher and the workflow easier. So sometimes it's that the data sits on its own when it's uh, not being analyzed. Um, so then they're, they're not in permanently connected together, but uh, the value of a virtual lab is pretty low when it doesn't have easy access to the data. And if you kind of look at the evolution of it, the first generation, maybe very early on, uh, the, the, the lab, labs that we built here were very much focused on the the computing workflow uh, and people had to bring the data in uh, and and that was a barrier and then you know, trying to get connect your bring your data into the virtual lab was uh, a challenge especially as the size of the data kept getting bigger and bigger uh, and the data sets were 
more complex and larger. So then people started saying, you know what, it's much easier to connect the data directly. So it evolved into the point where you had access to your data sets uh, yeah, wherever they were, uh, you know, whether it was in Dropbox or somewhere else, to bring that in and connect that up directly. Um, then we started having the data repositories and then being able to connect to those ones. The next step was people realizing that it, it's in many disciplines, you're not looking at your data in isolation, you're comparing it against a reference data set. So you then needed to go to those reference data sets, be connected up so they could be accessed. So it sort of evolves like that way. And 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 today the, the thinking has got to the point where you wouldn't think about, you know, most groups wouldn't think about uh, creating a, a virtual lab sort of environment without having deep connections into the data that's uh, relevant. Uh, and that's where the eco cloud I think has gone one step further because they they've connected up uh, what I keep calling the Google for data uh, uh, a search engine that that traverses a lot of the data repositories in in Australia and 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 makes it searchable. So they've connected that in so people can not only access the, the data they know, but they can search what else is there and then work out how to tap those in and connect up there. Kerry, you might have it more. Yeah. yeah. I, I would like also to comment a little bit on, on that. Yeah. Um, so I, I think one big hurdle is not really, we have a lot of good technologies already, but it's more like, it, it, it's more yeah, personalized or uh, cultural problem. For example, that researchers often at the end of a research uh, project are looking into data preservation or how, how to really save or store all the data um, during a project. Even if you have already the science gateway, you might not um, store all the metadata that led to, to the research results. And so it's really, I think, we, we need to work also on, on the conceptualization that it's worth it to put a little bit more work into data curation and working with the data life cycle during a, through a research project so that it's also still meaningful and five years later because sometimes it's not always enough to say oh yeah I, I move it to a repository so for example I have a collaborator and he works for a fantastic um, on a fantastic project also in environmental sciences and he says themselves they're, they're moving everything to Synodo and the data is laying there and at least they share it, it's in a repository, but it's not curated. So it's really, so I think it's a lot still manual work. You have to do that, that there is a feedback loop that it's really meaningful for researchers to, to still be findable and fair also in five years. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I agree, Sandra. I think um, any virtual research environment that in, makes it easy for researchers to automatically add metadata and curate their data as they go. I think that gets a big tick from me. Um, well, I just wanted to comment what Kieran was saying about the, the reference data sets and foundational data sets that are being um, put into a lot of the virtual labs now because, because you do need this um, a lot of this foundational data. Um, Crystal, you were asked, does the nature of a lab start influencing the kind of data that are collected? Obviously, the tools that you've got available do influence the data that you can collect, whether that's out in the field or or wherever. Um, but I think it's more that the data that's available influences the types of research that can be done. So, um, for instance, I was at a digital humanities conference uh, a few years ago, and they were talking about the choice to digitize certain records in, I think it was in um, Britain, in the, the home office records. And it was a, it's a somewhat arbitrary decision of which years they start digitizing. It's sort of if they've had a request to digitize a certain, um, to use a certain year, they'll digitize all those records. And so all of a sudden you get this huge um, amount of research, amount of papers put out on those specific years and people suddenly start to think that those years are really important um, for the correspondence from the, the home office. But actually it's just because that's the data that's available easily. And I think the same thing happens in lots of disciplines. Um, a lot of our um, a lot of our platforms are putting um, is around EcoCloud and um, agricultural platforms are trying to get these foundational data sets 
from um, from climate and soils and a whole lot of other um, related data. And what that availability then influences what the researchers can do and the questions that they can answer. So I think the more data that we can connect into these, more reference sets we can connect in, um, the more questions that the researchers can answer. Thank you. So yeah, I have I have a look at the <laughs> at the time. So we have two minutes left in this session. So I'm happy, you know, if anyone has a last fast question about the topics. Otherwise, um, again, it would be great if you sign up in the document um, so that we can contact maybe for working groups. Or if you haven't um, signed up for, for the interest group yet, that would be great if you do that. Um, so we try to be at every plenary. Being virtual at the moment, it's not so tough <laughs> for the traveling, but uh, yeah, uh, therefore it's tough for, for the time zones <laughs> to, to have these meetings for, for a couple of things. So yeah, thank you everyone for, for joining. Oh, first I say, okay, fast question. And then I give you a little bit of time to maybe have a last fast question. So oh. one is unmuting. So I take that as a sign that <laughs> that nobody wants uh, to ask the last question. So yeah, as I said, thank you very much for joining. We are really, um, we will look into building working groups. So I like the idea from Mike that we do a working group about that and reaching out. I like the catalog idea that we're working there together. Um, that, that would be a good goal for us. So, and we are at the full, no, half hour, it's a full half hour. <laughs> and uh, great for, yeah, thanks again for the talks and uh, for all the contributions and have a nice RDA, further RDA.